Thank, thank you very much. So it's a pleasure, I'll say, to, to let you know that the new software has been released at this meeting. Uh, it's the second iteration of the progression display, which is what I'll be showing you. And uh, you should be contacting your distributor for your upgrades. <clears throat> so when it comes to determining progression in keratoconus, for years we've relied on old, old methods. KMAX, and I'm a car person, and this is something in the US we call an idiot light. It lets you know when you've gone too far and damage has already been done. And that's kind of what we've been doing with keratoconus. When you rely on things like KMAX, basically what it means is that you've had changes in the anterior surface, you've lost vision, and if you use KMAX to determine pro progression, it basically means that you've lost even more vision. We really need a way to monitor things like we do in a car, and that is this. In other words, we want to know when things are going bad before they actually happen. So what is the holy grail? The holy grail for progression should allow us, one, the earliest identification of disease and the ability to intervene before we lose vision. If you think the, about the rest of medicine, if we talk about, let's say, high blood pressure, we don't treat high blood pressure only after the first stroke. We don't treat diabetes after the first episode of ketoacidosis. We don't treat high cholesterol after the first MI. And we're ophthalmologists, but we don't treat glaucoma only after field loss. We intervene to prevent sequelae. But why do we then treat keratoconus only after the patient has already lost vision? If we look at all the prior progression parameters, except for pachymetry here, if you look at this list, they're all anterior surface parameters. So again, if we're waiting till further deterioration of the anterior surface, that means that we're waiting again till the patient loses more vision. KMAX, which has been used in the past and still being currently used in a number of studies, is really no longer a valid parameter if we want to identify disease at the earliest possible stage. For those of you familiar with the Bell and Ambrosia display, you can see here two vastly abnormal eyes, but if you look here, you'll notice that the anterior surface is completely normal, highly abnormal eye. If you look on the right side, you'll notice that every single parameter is abnormal except for the anterior surface. Again, a normal anterior surface. This is true disease. It's, it's true disease. We call it subclinical keratoconus. Subclinical keratoconus is true disease. It just means that the patient is relatively asymptomatic because the anterior surface is good and visual acuity is good but it's true disease. This is where you want to identify disease. So a few years ago, we developed what we call the ABCD keratoconus dis display. And we did that because Amsler Crumac is an outdated 17-year-old display that was actually based on a keratometer and an optical pachymeter. Most of you probably don't even have these in your office any longer. Amsler Crumac was appropriate when all we had was penetrating keratoplasty and rigid lenses, treatments for advanced disease. The ABCD allowed us to grade each anatomical layer se separately. In addition, if you think about it, Amsler Crumac was a measurement based on the center of the cornea, and the ABCD is measured on the thinnest point, or basically the cent center of the cone. A was for the anterior surface. It was the anterior radius of curvature taken from the three millimeter zone, centered on the thinnest point. B was for back or posterior radius of curvature. C was the thinnest pachymetry, not just a central apical reading, and D was distance visual acuity. But the real goal of developing the ABCD wasn't just the classification, it was to allow us to make a progression display to determine when in each, each anatomical layer has statistically changed. And this is what the new or the second iteration of the display looks like, and I'll go over it in some detail with you. It displays each parameter. Here's the A parameter for the anterior surface, B for back, posterior, C, minimal corneal thickness, and D is distance visual acuity. It compares the change to two different gates, one based on a normal population shown in green and one based on a keratocotic population in red. It shows you an 80% confidence interval, which is the hatch, hatch lines, and a 95% confidence interval, which is the solid lines. Why do we have two different populations? Well, for your early, very early subclinical or young patients, those measurements are probably more closely related to the normal population and noise levels, 
while your more advanced keratoconics are a noisier group, and there you may want to compare it to the keratoconic population. We also show you in tabular form, which we show on the back, a number of parameters that have been used in the past. Here we show the classification of the ABCD, bad D, progression index, AFT max, K max, Q values, and then all the anterior parameters that have been used in, in the past. So we not only do we give you the ABCD parameters, but we show you a number of other parameters in case you would like to follow those. We allow you to designate what your baseline exam is, and then you can also designate when you've done treatment. Treatment, in this case, really means cross-linking. Again, you can choose whether you want to compare those values against a normal population or a cataconic. It will default to showing both. So here you can see this same patient. On the upper map, we defaulted to only show the normal population. On the lower map, we show the keratoconic population. And you'll, you'll notice on the keratoconic population, the gates are fur further out. In other words, because it's a noisier measurement, you need more change in the keratoconic population comparison to reach those statistical limits. This gets a little confusing. There's two different ways of showing the data. One is called aligned at baseline. The other one is called full scale. I will just tell you simply, it defaults to aligned at baseline, and basically that's all you're ever really going to use. But what the difference is, aligned at baseline if you look at each parameter, the scales for each parameter are different. So it maximizes the se separation. Full scale keeps the scale same throughout. So if you look at the gates on aligned at baseline, they're further spread out and they're very tight here. So it defaults to this. The, the limitation of, of baseline is that you lose the anatomical grading system, which you retain here. You notice again, the scales are all different on the A, B, C, and D. But again, it will default to that because it's a progression display, and this makes determining progression a little bit easier. Additionally, we will drop all those gates if you indicate there's been a cross-linking done because those noise measurements don't apply to once cross-linking has been performed. We are currently collaborating on generating that data, but at the moment, we do not have noise measurements post-cross-linking. -cross so I'm going to skip past this. So again, I already showed you that if you indicate when a cross-linking was done, you'll notice that there are no gates shown below that cross-linking date. So let's look at a couple of clinical examples. So this is a 15-year-old with advanced keratoconus that's been followed over seven years. And here you can just see a continued progression of disease. This is the anterior surface. Notice again, continued progression. Posterior surface, continu continued progression. Corneal thickness, so in other words, continued to thin. And this one, they, did, they did, did not enter the distance visual acuity. Obviously, distance visual acuity is not measured by the pentacam, so it's user-operated. So again, here we're just seeing progressive change on each level. But here's where you really have the clinical utility of this exam. This is a 15-year-old with very early keratoconus followed for just over a year. Notice to the far right, we're showing you the K-Max exams. And actually, the K-max hasn't changed, 46.1, 45.5, 45.8, no statistical difference there. And if you look at the anterior surface, again, it's been relatively stable. But look what's going on in the back of the cornea. Highly significant change from exam to exam, well past the 95% confidence interval. This is an indication of progressive disease. Again, whether you treat or not is a physician determination with the patient, but relying solely on K-Max would miss a truly progressive disease. This is picking up disease at the earliest possible stage and documenting that it's progressive and then you deciding whether you want to intervene or not. Here's another example of an 18-year-old with stable K-Max. You can look at the K-Max here, 48.6, 48.4, and again, stable here. Minor change in the right eye, but look what's going on here again. Marked progression well past the 95% confidence interval. Here's a patient already with fairly advanced disease. The bad D is over 7. And if we look down here at the K-max again, it actually looks like it's getting a little bit better. Again, no real change in the anterior surface, <clears throat> but progressive change out to about the 90% confidence interval and well past the 95% confidence interval on corneal th thickness. So again, even with advanced disease, you can see stability on the anterior surface, but pro progressive disease. 
So how do we diagnose progression of keratoconus? We recognize that the disassociation of clinical progression with changes in Kmax. We utilize a tomographic-based classification system that recognizes all the anatomical levels and a tomographic-based progression display to document when we obtain statistically significant change. How do we define progression after cross-linking? That's something we're still currently working on, and hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have some, some of that data to show you in the next iter iter iteration of the display. Thank you.